Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Abigail Keyes. I'm the Assistant Dean of Career Development here at the Yale School of Management, and we're excited to have you join us today. Um, I'm going to give some information about my office, and we are excited to share our 2019 employment statistics as well, our outcomes. I also have two panelists here with me who I will introduce a little bit later, so you'll get to hear some, from a second year student as well as a recent graduate about what the experience was for them as well. A little bit about the career development office here at Yale SOM to start. So as you may be aware, if, as you've been researching schools, Yale takes its mission to heart across all of the school. And the mission of Yale SOM is to educate leaders for business and society. We in the Career Development Office have our own vision that we operate um, inside of that mission, which is to empower dynamic careers and explore, educate, and thrive together. Really the key point here is we really look at our job to empower you and make it as easy as possible for you to manage your career throughout your career. In the short term for internships and full-time opportunities immediately following graduation, as well as providing lifelong career services to alumni. And really look at that as a continuum. So our team is divided into two subgroups. We have our career coaching and education team. And as it, the name sounds, they are the individuals who most often interact with students. They provide one-on-one -on -one coaching. They work a lot with providing programming, both large programming as well as small, much more tailored interactive programming. And they also um, work very closely with a lot of student leaders. On the other side, we have an employer partnerships team. And as their name suggests, they spend most of their time outwardly facing, really advocating on behalf of our students and alumni, working with employers, working with alumni, um, really creating engagement. And we define engagement very broadly of anything that we can really encourage and facilitate between employers and our students and alumni to make it as easy as possible for people to connect to the opportunities that you're excited and interested in. The one place where both of these teams interact and partner very closely is with the student clubs. And there are representatives from both sides that work with most of the professional clubs as well as a number of the affinity clubs here at Yale SOM as well. And there I am, um, and I lead the office. I also, in addition to supporting both of these teams, spend a lot of time working much more broadly with the administration, really advocating from a career perspective on behalf of all of our students. Just a little bit about how we look at um, career management. And I do choose the term career management very intentionally because it's not just about finding your internship or your full-time offer post-graduation. It's really how do you learn tools that will support your career throughout the rest of your career once you leave SOM. So the three main components that we see this as are assess, prepare, and connect. The assessment piece is really what do you want to do? What's important to you? What are your values? What are your most important criteria? And we have a number of tools to work with you and support you in trying to uncover those. The preparation piece is what most people think of as job search and um, you know, preparing your resume, preparing your interviewing skills, researching companies, everything that you need to do to actually land that job. And the connecting is actually connecting with people, whether it's networking or actually interviewing and um, everything that goes along with that. And there are a lot of different things that we tap into across SOM, as well as specifically through my office in order to do all three of these pieces. As you'll notice, it really, then you go back to connect, then you go back to assess. So as you connect and as you talk to people, you might start thinking, you know what, what I thought I, my goal was, it isn't, or I want to tweak it a little bit. And this really is an iterative process. And especially our career coaches support you every step of the way. Oops, I'm having trouble clicking. So, we have a robust curriculum to support all of these pieces. The first is foundational career management um, basics, really, I would say, that all students are expected to complete. Most of it is over the summer before you even arrive, and the rest is in August and September when you're first here. It's really, as I was saying, career management skills for a lifetime. And some of it may seem very basic for some of you, and some of it might be brand new for some of you. Our idea is to really level the playing field for everyone and also remind people who may already have these skills and be very successful at them why they're important and how do you make them even better. So it's really designed to set you up for success no matter where you're starting from. Then we start getting a little bit more refined and we have 
a series of different strategy sessions that students choose from. We have ones on resume writing, networking, international job search, um, both for international students looking in the US as well as for people looking for jobs abroad, or um, research and building a uh, target list. We actually have the librarian come to that and really get very deep into a lot of the different research tools so students can uncover different kinds of opportunities. These strategy sessions are intense. They're usually over lunchtime and people the idea is that you walk in one place in your career search and you walk out at an advanced and a better place. So if you walked in on, with a resume, your resume will get actual feedback and be improved by the time you walk out. Your target list will have additional targets on it. Or your interviewing skills, you'll have practiced different questions and you'll be that much better at it. And then we also do, as I mentioned before, a lot of individual one-on-one -on -one coaching. And this is the most tailored piece and it's very personalized and Especially here, as given how diverse the interests of all of our students are, I'd say it's absolutely vital because what's the right strategy for one person might not be the right strategy for someone else. And it's very easy to look around and think that you should be doing exactly what your classmates are doing. And sometimes that is accurate and sometimes it's not. Sometimes based on your goals and your background, you might need a very different strategy. So our coaches work with you one-on-one -on -one to figure out what's your strategy and how will you be the most successful. Um, as I said, you know, our, our curriculum is comprehensive, it's collaborative, it's integrated, it's personalized, flexible, really results oriented. This is by far the most, um, the two in the middle are the most important to me, that it's really student centric and results oriented. We wanna make sure that you're using your time here as best you can. And we know how busy business school can be and we really wanna support you in having your goals turn out. And first in really identifying what are your goals so then we can really work with you and help you get there. Just some quick facts. Um, each year we have over 2,000 coaching appointments, over 60 CDO career related workshops and programs, over 100 company visits, over 1,200 campus interviews, 2,000 unique job postings for our current students. Um, about 25% of our students find employment outside of our top five industries, which is really amazing and speaks to the diversity of the students and the choices that our students make. Students find employment across over 100 cities across the globe each year. And this year, our median starting salary was $130,000, which we are thrilled about, especially because we really feel like our students make hard choices and sometimes turn down higher salaries to really follow what is important to them. And even with that, we have a really strong, um, they get paid for it anyway, which is what's really exciting to us. So timing, um, we actually have a lot of these charts for very specifics for lots of different industries and goals that people have. And this is a general one, just trying to put them all together. So people have a sense of what is it really like to be in business school? When should I be thinking about what? Uh, as you can see, for most industries, networking starts in the middle of September and goes through the entire year. For first years, interviewing generally starts in January and could go through May. Depending on the organization that you are interested in, depending on whether they hire one or two interns a year or 20 or 50 or 100, um, can really have a big impact on that. For many industries, things like media and entertainment or real estate, a lot of the offers are later in the year because companies don't commit to hiring for those internships until much closer to the summer. For other industries, particularly consulting, investment banking, CPGs, some of the large tech companies, the ones that you can see on the bottom, there are campus presentations and coffee chats and networking that starts in the middle of September. And it is a much more formalized campus-based process for the most part. Even companies that aren't necessarily coming to a campus here or otherwise are usually following that kind of earlier timeline though. Their interviews are usually January through March depending on the specifics of the company or industry. Um, so it's all a little bit earlier. One of the things I like to tell people is if you aren't sure if you're interested in tech or some of the large CPGs or consulting or investment banking, let yourself stay in the process as you explore other things until you're clear you don't want to do it. Because you don't want to look back in December and say, oh, I wish I had actually done some of this. That said, you also, it's really great to continue to explore and expand and that's why people are here. And many of our students find what they're interested in through a class that they took or something that they never heard of or a second year that they talked to and thought, wow, I didn't even know that was a job. And we really encourage students to continue that exploration and really that assessment phase and to keep going back to it to make sure that you're making the best choice for yourself. So now what you're expecting, the employment outcomes. We are very excited about our, um, the success of our class of 2019. And this chart shows um, 
really the breakdown of where did people go? What were these outcomes? And this information is all live on our website. If you have specific industries you want to see more information on, um, in terms of salary information or anything else, you can actually click into each of the sections of it and see those details. I ask you to do that a little bit later so we can continue this conversation, but all of that information is available to you, and I encourage you to explore it if you're curious. What I want to point out is a few things. One, um, our top employers for 2019 for full-time, and I define top by employers that five or more students accepted offers at. Um, these are in alphabetical order, though. Our Amazon, Bain and, Bain and Company, BCG, Deloitte, EY Parthenon, IBM, JP Morgan Chase, McKinsey, and Morgan Stanley. As you can see, they are heavily weighted in consulting and banking, and that's not surprising given the vast numbers that those companies hire overall anyway. What I think is most interesting about the pie chart, though, is really the diversity of pieces of the pie. You know, even with all of this, so many of our students really make other kinds of choices and choose across all industries. And I'm going to dive into really what does it mean and what some of, what's inside of some of these in a minute. But even just the breakdown of the chart itself is very indicative of the really, um, I'd say, dynamic and robust community we have here at SOM and the interests that people have. So on the consulting side, I like to point out who is included in that consulting, that 37% that's in consulting. And this includes full-time and internship in terms of the companies. So clearly, many of them are ones that you might expect or think of as consulting, Bain, PCG, McKinsey, some of the ones that were also some of our largest employers this year. But also in here are a number that focus on nonprofit consulting and social impact issues. Um, CCS fundraising is one of those, Center for Public Impact. Um, Consensus Building Institute, Guidehouse, ID Insights, Titan focuses on education, TC, Wellspring Consulting. So there's a lot of nuances within this consulting bucket. Um, there are also a number of healthcare companies included in here that really focus on healthcare consulting. Chartis, ZS, Manat Health, Huron Consulting Group are, are really focused on healthcare. Um, there are also some that are a little more digital and um, data analytics, like end-to-end -end analytics. Um, Insight and IDEO are much more design and innovation focused. So there are a lot of different pieces inside of this. Um, and I really encourage you, when you look at any school's stats, there are the whole numbers, but then what, what does that actually mean? What kinds of organizations are students really choosing? And we're very proud of all of our students who are choosing the much more tra traditional strategy firms that people think that whole bucket is. We're also just as proud of our students who are finding in quote unquote consulting firms, opportunities to serve nonprofits or to work with healthcare or work with really something that, or sustainability or something that really follows what they're passionate about. And while it all rolls out up to one industry name, the way that the companies are technically categorized, it's important to know what does that mean and what does it mean for you and your goals? Not that differently um, for financial services. You can see that the financial services breadth of companies for internships and full time is much larger, even though it's a smaller piece of the full pie. And that's not actually that surprising, given that our students, yes, we have a number of students who go to some of the large banks, and then we have a lot of students who do a lot of different things within financial services. There are a number of small VCs in here. There are, um, includes both, you know, bulge bracket as well as boutique investment banks. We have some investment management, Bridgewater, BlackRock, Cambridge Associates, Hill House Capital, which is in China. We also have some impact inve investing that's included in this list. Um, Acumen, for instance, is actually a nonprofit that's focused on impact investing because it's really, um, it is a financial services company technically, but some people would say that it is, you could put it in a nonprofit bucket or some people would say you should put it in a social impact bucket. So it's important again to really look into what does that actually mean and what does it mean for you? And, which of these companies are the ones that are really exciting and interesting to you? Which have you never heard of and maybe you want to explore? The retail and technology. So I like to put these together because if you look at it quickly, a number of the companies that are technically retail, according to how we have them categorized, many people often think of as technology. Amazon is the perfect example of that, that for the most part is often um, thought of as a tech company, but is categorized still as retail, given its origins. So it's important to really look at both together if really these, this is an area that's interesting to you and to look at really who are these companies. There are things like Microsoft, IBM, Apple, Google, Facebook, as well as some smaller companies. And you know, 
really looking at what, what, what are the kinds of companies that you're interested in and what are the opportunities that most excite you. Here we have our government and nonprofit employers, and this includes both um, full-time and internship again. And the nonprofit does include some education organizations, and otherwise it's mostly foundations. Everything else, as I mentioned before, often ends up finding its way to another industry. If it is financial services and happens to be organized as a nonprofit, it is under financial services. So um, that happens across a number of healthcare companies that are listed under healthcare are organized as nonprofits. And so what ends up left in the nonprofit bucket, for the most part, ends up being mostly foundations and, um, and some education organizations. We also have a number of government um, entities here, which, um, and again, this is across full-time and internship where people ended up this year. And it's really exciting to see that year to year, there's a lot of change in terms of the choices people make, especially for nonprofit and government, which is why I like to point it out. It's something that um, students, there's always a passion about at SOM, there's a lot of support for it. And every year, students have different kinds of choices that they're actually making in the end. So it's important to really look at both the internship choices people are making and the full-time, and how that really can vary year over year, just based on the individuals and the dynamic, really diverse um, population that we have here. Now I'm excited to move on to our student panelists. We have, um, well, student and alum panelists. We're excited to have a variety for you. Um, I have. Clarine Renting, who's here with me, she is a second year, and I'm going to let them both introduce themselves. And I have also remotely joining us Isaac Bernstein, who is a 2018 SOM grad. And we are excited to have both of you here. Thank you for spending some time with us. I um, really encourage you to, to answer as candidly as possible. I have some questions that I'm going to start with for them, and then I will also at some point open it up. And if you have questions that you'd like to ask either me or to Isaac and Clarine, please, um, you can write them in, and we will um, answer those as well. Before we get to that part, though, I would just like both of you to introduce yourself with a brief um, pre-SOM background, including your undergraduate institution, work experience, why you chose SOM, or why you chose an MBA at SOM specifically. Also, if you could describe your current career focus, so either um, really how you chose your first post-MBA role and you know, what, how that's going for you, or Clarine, um, you know, how, you're, how you've been looking at that and how you're choosing where you're going um, and really where, where you will be going. And do you want to start, Clarine? Yeah, thanks, Abigail. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Clarine. I go by Claire. I'm a second year MBA student here at ELSOM. Super excited to be here to share with you my experience so far. Um, OK, so pre-SOM, I was working in three different industries. So I was working um, at an asset management firm called Franklin Templeton, and it was based in Singapore. I'm originally from Jakarta, from Indonesia. Um, sorry, before that, a step, uh, taking one step uh, back, I went to University of Washington for my undergrad. And right after that, I moved to Singapore, worked for Franklin Templeton, which is an asset management firm based in Singapore. Um, and right after asset management, I did some nonprofit work for a education-focused nonprofit based in Jakarta. So I moved back home to Jakarta. And then after that, I got interested in technology venture capital firm. And there was an opportunity for me to join a local tech venture capital fund. So I did that. And so that was what I did right before joining, before coming to SOM. Why I chose SOM to begin with, I was really attracted to the, the motto of educating business uh, for educating business leaders and society. Um, I think it is, I got intrigued with that. And then I started from, from talking to, I reached out to a couple of alumni and also current students, started talking to them about um, their experience and realized that I really felt connected the most with the people I talked to at SLM. And I was also actually looking at the student employment data at the time and literally thought to myself, wow, there are other companies that I couldn't find in other schools' employment data. So that also intrigued me, the fact that it is you know, coming from a very worldwide, uh, world, like renowned global institution like Yale, it is also a very powerful brand. And I think 
now, and I can share with you later about how, you know, my experience here at SOM so far and the connection and relationship with Yale overall, it really, to me, it's, it's just, I thought that if I, if I was going to this school, it's going to be a lot of um, eye-opening experience. And I really wanted to get more perspectives out of just, um, just going to school. Uh, why is I'm a career focus? So I interned at a consulting firm, Bain & Company, back home in Jakarta. Uh, we'll be going back there full time after school, so super excited um, to be back in, my home is in Jakarta, but Bain in Southeast Asia basically work together very closely as a region, so really excited to, to go back to Southeast Asia. Um, in the long run, my interest play in education, nonprofit, and also sustainability. I know that's a lot of interest. I'm, I'm a lady of a lot of interest. So to be frank with you, I don't know exactly yet, but I can see myself being consultant in the next two years and then um, still having those three sectors as kind of a, like true north buckets for me for now. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Isaac, um, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, great. Uh, so thanks for having me. I uh, graduated from SOM in 2018 with my MBA. Uh, I uh, first uh, graduated from Williams College uh, a number of years ago with my bachelor's in history, and I had six years of work experience before going to SOM. I split that first between um, uh, arts philanthropy and then uh, marketing strategy. So I went from a very small nonprofit to a very large marketing conglomerate. Um, and then I chose SOM when I was looking at business schools, really above and all uh, for the culture and the community that I saw that, that we have here at SOM. Uh, SOM is not a school that puts you on a conveyor belt and, and spits out an eye banker or a consultant at the end of the day, although it delivers, um, you know, the 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 same elite outcomes as you'd want from any top business school. Uh, the, the process that I anticipated and then what I found was, was really something that uh, understood me and, and that I could make work for me. So that's, that's sort of the gist of, of why I chose SOM. While I was a student, I, I interned at uh, IBM in their marketing uh, department. So I, I was interested in technology but interested in, in taking the, the, making the pivot one step at a time, as it were. So since I had a marketing background um, in consumer goods, I decided to change the industry vertical but keep the function somewhat consistent. And then after I saw that, that there was a, a match there for me with IBM, I then pursued the full-time opportunity I now have in corporate strategy. So kind of completing the pivot um, into a new uh, enterprise process area uh, and, and so now doing the work of helping, helping uh, turn this, this big uh, company around. Great, thank you. So um, for both of you, in whichever order you feel like answering, in what ways would you describe your experience and choices as a story behind the data, um, one that might not be fully reflected in the outcomes that you've chosen? So I, I can speak on that. Um, I, yeah, it was funny to me to see IBM show up in the uh, the list of largest employers uh, from SOM because I don't think of it that way. Although I do have a number of of my colleagues here, um, what I want to speak about is the diversity of outcomes that I see among my peer group. So there are a few of us in the office here, and that's actually a huge benefit to me um, and to building my network sort of post SOM. But but the reality is, even you know, for a school that that's relatively small compared to its peers in terms of class size. You know, I was amazed at uh, how diverse uh, the interests of my classmates were and how that drove them to pursue really different things. And even, you know, something that we miss even when we sort of talk about the 30-something percent of people that go into consulting because the people I know who are at Insight or are at Ideas 42 or Idea Couture are living very different lives from the people at Bain or McKinsey or BCG. And um, they're doing so because they have a huge range of interests and passions. Um, so sort of the, 
the aggregated data, it tells you a story about where people tend to go, and I, I think that's valid at the same time. Um, it really is the case that, that it's a personal journey that you get on when you, when you come to SOM, and it, it's really a personal journey uh, to whatever you find as your next job. It's not like you, you sign up for, the, for a given track and it just takes you, escorts you along to that endpoint. So that's what I'd like to emphasize. Great. I would, I would echo Isaac, and I think this is a great time to talk about internship fun, if, if, if you don't mind. It's, I think it's definitely something that I, I really appreciate. Um, you know, student clubs here are big. It's, it's a student-run school, really. Um, we have so many club events and student-run um, student clubs. So one of them is called internship fun, um, whereby uh, students who are interested to have an, a summer internship in nonprofit or social enterprise should not, the idea is that if they get an offer from this internship but they are not getting paid for the summer, that the internship fund um, will be able to give them um, funding um, so that money or financial constraints should not be a you know, a cause for them not to take the opportunity if they really want it and like it. So an example of that is actually in one of the um, the report that we saw, there is a nonprofit called Matter, uh, Matter Initiativa. It's, it's based in Peru. So I was in Peru for international experience trip, and my friend interned at Matter, but it was not part of, uh, she didn't go through uh, kind of like the usual route, like what you say, like conveyor belt of, you know, IB or, or consulting, really. She, when we were in Peru together with the professor and all the students, we did like a pro bono consulting work for Matra Initiativa, and that's how she got her internship. And so I think it's, to echo what Isaac said, the diversity of it all really, I, now that I'm a second year student, um, having talked to my classmates that were just really all over the world um, over the summer doing different things. When they came back for fall one, I really had some of the best conversations and really a lot of personal yeah, reflection also um, that really came from your classmates. Great, thank yeah. you. Um, the other thing, I just want to sort of put a plug. You mentioned the internship fund. Mm -hmm. We also have a loan forgiveness program for students who qualify who are going into nonprofits for full-time positions after they graduate. And so, you know, as a school, we really have a huge commitment to people making the choices that are really what you're most committed to, regardless of what the financial impact may or may not be. Um, so just to, there is, there is sort of an other alternative to support students in those choices afterwards as well. Um, so the next question I have for you is if you could describe your internship searches. Some of you, you've mentioned it a little bit, um, but if in a little bit more detail. And really, what was that internship experience like? Um, and then also your full-time search or full-time decision, how that came about. Really focusing on how you leveraged SOM resources um, and the community, whether it was a CDO or clubs or faculty or classmates. Um, what activities you, did you participate in? really around the school, around the university, that you feel like contributed to your career success. Clarine, do you want to start with this one? Yes, I'll start with, this is still very fresh in my mind. When <laughs> I was searching for internship um, for this summer. I think to SOM, to begin with, SOM community has been super supportive. Um, I was specifically looking for internship position internationally. Um, for personal reason, I was looking at Australia, but then also because I was originally from Jakarta, I was looking at Jakarta. But then because I lived in Seattle um, for four years, I loved the city, so I was also looking at Seattle. So I really was looking all over the place. Um, one, I, and I was looking for a consulting, consulting opportunities at the time. Um, the consulting club here has been super, super helpful in my opinion. Um, they really, they, it's a very structured process. They teach, they teach, they share information, but it's really treated kind of like as a mini class um, every week where they teach you how to case, they teach you how to network, they teach you how to, um, to come up with your behavioral story and practice behavioral story. 
In addition to that, because especially in my case, I was I had three past employers before joining SLM, and I struggled a bit with my behavioral story in terms of when people ask me when during the interview, when the interviewer asked me to talk talk to me about your resume, and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's <laughs> so many things. I actually came up to um, CDO for uh, to one of the individual coaches that really helped me um, craft that story. And then I remember there was this one mock behavioral, mock behavioral uh, practice. So you sign up through CDO and then you have a 30 minute mock behavioral as if it was an, an actual behavioral interview. And the feedback that I got from that event was, was really helpful. Um, so that's in terms of from the professional um, point of view. The Community is something that I'm forever grateful of in, in, at, at SOM. Um, recruiting for consulting was not easy. It, it could be stressful, but people are really supportive of each other. My classmates um, always, you know, second year students at the time, they graduated already, but the second year students were always willing to, to, to help. Um, they helped me with casing, they helped me with even mental um, support as well, because yeah, you get tired and sometimes it's stressful, especially because of the coursework, but they're always there and they make sure that you will get through this. So I think from the support of the community and also the help from Consulting Club and CDO, all three combined were really helpful um, for me to secure my internship. Great, thanks. Isaac, do you have anything to add or anything different you want to? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just say when I started at SOM, I was very open to possibilities. And so when I went through my internship hunt, while technology was for me a true north, it, didn't, it wasn't something that I uh, used to really limit my search. And I think that's just something kind of worth knowing. You, you, know, you may get the advice, and I think it's valid advice, that you have to focus in very quickly in order to be effective in how you use your time pursuing opportunities. But that said, I, uh, when I think back on my first semester of SOM, I think about going to consulting club because of all the general purpose skills you pick up there, in addition to exposure to the consulting industry. I think about the technology club and, uh, and uh, you know, the sort of the career stuff that they do there. But I also think about retail. I think about conversations I had um, in CPG or even pharma, uh, it, I think it behooved me to have broad conversations because for me, you know, I really didn't actually know if technology was the industry I wanted to be in or something closer to the role. And, and so my internship process was one where I kind of thought I knew where I was going, but I certainly took the time to explore some side paths. Um, and that's something that's very easy to do just through all the folks who show up on campus. So I just add that to the story. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask you one more question Then I know we've been getting in some questions so then I'm going to move to those. But um, before I do that, what do you wish you knew before embarking on your initial internship search? That it is going to, oh, sorry, Isaac, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take this one okay. first. So, um, what I wish I knew, that it was, it's, it's going to be a long, um, it requires lots of stamina, um, that it is also a stamina and a lot of thinking and strategizing. Um, I don't think, I think I would have come to um, talk to the second years and also the CDO earlier when I first started at SOM, maybe around fall one. Well, yeah, fall one, we started the internship um, recruiting since kind of in October, um, September, October. However, I think one of the reasons of why it was a little stressful for me was because I was struggling with like the, the backup plan so I think what I wish I had known is that there are so many other opportunities out there and that it, you should not be over-indexing in only one opportunity because, you know, with the diversity of SOM and the relationships that 
the school is able to develop with uh, other employers that you can really talk to just sending an email or t trying to have like an informational chat with literally almost all the employers out there being a student at the LSOM, it's so, it opened so many doors and I wish I would have kind of used that, um, that opportunity earlier in the game. As you were using it, how um, responsive did you feel like alumni were? Oh, I have a story on that actually, on alumni. I, um, I had a recent, I think 2017, yeah, she graduated in 2017. And I had mentioned before that I was looking for an opportunity in Australia because of a personal reason my, uh, my partner was there. Um, I reached out to her and until today I still have not met her, but she was pivotal. Like literally she was very, very helpful in helping me navigate. She introduced me to some people in BCG. Um, she was working at BCG in Melbourne. And then um, actually even before that, when I was applying for SOM, she gave me feedback to my essay and until today I still haven't met her. So I think this goes to show in terms of how SOM really wanna help each other and especially when they feel like they, they could really uh, add value in terms of how you can succeed, uh, succeed in SOM and after, they, they, they will, are super willing to, to give you a, a helping hand. And I, I, yeah, until today, I still need to meet her um, because I still, I haven't met her, but I'm so thankful for, for the alumni network. Great. Isaac, do you have anything to, to add or what's your experience been? Um. Well, I certainly agree with everything that Claire just said about uh, you know sort of the nature of the alumni network. I I'd say one thing, and kind of consistent with that, the one thing that um, that I think I wish I had internalized better before my internship was was that it makes sense I think to see the internship as an opportunity to have a new type of um, professional experience more than it makes sense to look at the internship as an opportunity to uh, add another uh, line to your resume. Great, no, fantastic. So now I'm going to go to some questions we've got in. Uh, some of them I'll answer, and if you guys have anything to add in, just please chime in. Um, the first one, um, Someone asked about what help is available to admitted students who pursue early recruitment or diversity programs. So we do actually work pretty closely with the students who are part of consortium, as well as the, those going to the Forte Conference. Um, for other kinds of diversity programs, it varies depending on the timing. So we do provide information about them. We do encourage you to reach out to our office. And because we start working with all students in June, a lot of them overlap with that timing anyway. And if there are needs for people to get feedback or work with us uh, in some way before that, it really, it depends on a one-off basis depending on what makes the most sense to make you make sure that you're as successful as possible. Um, someone else asked about um, students returning, students finding, international students finding jobs in the US versus returning back to where they come from. Um, sometimes because of, you know, it's not a secret that they're very, um, real visa challenges these days. And it is really hard for international students. What I will say is I do look at the statistics in terms of where do our international students end up versus our domestic US students. And in the end, the number of them who are employed three months out, which is when it's officially measured, is indistinguishable from US students versus international students. About half of our international students choose to stay in the US and about half choose to go other places like Clarine. Um, I'm not going to pretend that it's easy, though. For, the student, for international students who want to stay in the US, most of them who really are focused on that are successful, and it takes a lot more work. Mm -hmm. It definitely um, it's, it is a challenge, and it's one that is overcomable and surmountable, and it takes a lot of work. And we work very closely with those students. We work very closely with employers. Um, but it, it, it definitely, I'd say, I don't know what how to measure this in any scientific way, but I would argue it probably takes at least 10 times the effort for those students at this point, just given 
um, really how much so many companies are pulling back on sponsoring students. That said, there are still a lot of companies that are sponsoring students, and our students have been very successful, and we've been excited that you know, on a salary basis, they've been right in line with the median overall, and success-wise and employment-wise, they've been right in line. I, it's not lost to me, though, that it is taking a lot more effort for those students than, um, than for some of their US citizen counterparts. Do you have anything to add from an international perspective? I would agree with you. I think um, your answer is very real. Um, I do know a couple of my classmates who are international students who got a offer, got multiple offers from U.S. companies, but I also witnessed how hard they worked yep. um, for interviews and then um, just to just to really really get that opportunity to get an offer, but then also visa sponsorship. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is not impossible, but it will take a lot of work. But then again, I think that's when the supportive community really is um, helpful because, I mean, here I can, I can tell you how people would not, if, if someone seems you know, down or stressed because of like recruiting, we always somehow just find ways to help each other. And I think, I truly believe that, uh, I don't know which school you're looking into, but I don't think every school has that culture. And I think if you are really going to be spending time, energy, investment in business school, the culture is, is definitely a, um, one of the most important consider considerations. Great, thank you. Um, there are a few quick questions that I can give you answers to that people have asked. Someone asked if international students are eligible for government roles. Um, some of the government jobs people take are actually in other countries. For the ones in the US, it really depends on the agency and the role. Some are open to international students and some are limited. It, it's much more specific from agency to agency or part of the government. Um, the other, uh, I'm just looking at, there are a number of you asking similar questions, which is great. Um, a few people asked about information about alumni, um, 10, 20, 30 years out, depending on the question that I'm looking at from you, which is, you know, we have, we do have information on that. I don't have it in the same format or way that we share. Um, a lot of that is available on our website if you look under alumni and look at really where our alum, where are our alumni. Um, I would argue that many of our student, many of our graduates who start in consulting end up in different um, industries later on. They end up specializing and in moving into different industries, as is common across all schools. And really, what just really in many ways how the consulting industry is designed to have that happen. Um, and so there is a lot of movement there. I don't have it though in the same kinds of set pie charts at different times as um, as might be actually really great to look at, unfortunately. Um, Building off of what Claire was just talking about, you know, one of the things, there's a question about what employers think of Yale SOM students. And consistently, the feedback that I get from employers directly, both alumni as well as not alumni, is they really appreciate the community here. They appreciate how collaborative our students are. They appreciate how our students treat each other. Uh, and a banking employer was just commenting on how when students are talking in networking events and the students tend to be very stressed, you know, with, you know, good reason um, in many cases, that even with that, that as they're talking in, you know, sort of a circle of students and someone from a company, that they're so polite with each other and they're so encouraging of each other. And they really don't necessarily always have that experience across all business schools, that there is really a sense of we're all in this together and the more of us that succeed, the more of us who succeed. And I think that that is across industries that that plays out. And it's something that I'm constantly hearing. The other thing is that employers really comment on how strong the skills are of our students. Our students have some of the best faculty in the world and that really plays out in how well they answer technical questions and in interviews across industries. And so I think that there's, um, there's a lot that goes into that that I hear from employers about SOM students. And you know, Isaac, you are now sort of a little bit on the other side. You may have something that you may wanna add to that as well. <laughs> Put you on the spot in that one. <laughs> well, uh, on the IBM corporate strategy team, there are currently um, nine, no, something around nine uh, SOM students from 2016 through 2019. So I'd say they're pretty happy with 
what they're getting. <laughs> Great. Um, we're almost out of time, but I have one more question for Claire and Isaac. But before that, uh, there's just um, two quick questions I do want to answer, probably not giving them the time that they deserve, which I acknowledge. So if you have follow-up questions, you can feel free to reach out to me. Um, one is how the professional clubs collaborate with the CDO. As I mentioned earlier, the professional clubs have a representative from the coaching side as well as the employer side of my team. And many of the clubs meet weekly with those individuals. Sometimes it's bi-weekly, it depends on the club. And they really work very closely in terms of um, partnering with employers, partnering with um, students, making sure that the students are getting the training that they need, making sure that employers have the access to the students that they're interested in, and really being able to balance it all. They also collaborate a lot. You know, one of the things that uh, a great innovation that just came out of that collaboration is the healthcare club in a few weeks is having what they're calling a virtual trek. So instead of actually physically going to a number of different healthcare companies, um, mostly in the on the West Coast, they are designing together with my office and it came out of a number of brainstorming sessions, a way to connect those students with those employers in a virtual way, but with the same kind of experience of multiple employers on a single day getting to have a lot of that experience. So there are a lot of different ways that that happens, but it is very much an ongoing conversation and we really see the student leaders as our partners in that. Um, someone asked about uh, tech companies and what tech companies see Yale as a target school. Amazon hires a lot of people here. Wayfair hires very consistently numbers. Um, Google hired a lot of people this year and continues to want to even build that partnership even more. Facebook as well. Um, so you know, we definitely have a lot of tech companies. I'm sure there are a lot that I'm forgetting, but just given those big names, they really they recruit here very heavily. And if anything, are always looking for how do we attract more of your students. So we're excited about that as well. Um, given that we just have time for one last question, and Isaac, I know you need to run off, so I'm going to ask you to start with this. Um, what do you wish you'd known when you were applying to schools? What advice can you offer pers prospective students um, who are trying to decide what school to attend? I wish I had uh, taken, taken or internalized more the idea that the schools don't do the work for me of, of introspecting, thinking about who I am, what, what uh, kind of professional life will make me happy, and then pursuing it. Um, the resources that SOM makes available to facilitate that are phenomenal. Um, but ultimately, the, the journey that I had to go on for myself was one that I think I could have expedited if from the beginning I had been ready for it. Great. Thank you. Brian? For me, um, I wish somebody would have told me that business school is fun, graduate school is definitely fun, and it's great. It's uh, looking back now, I mean, I can't believe I'm graduating soon, and I'm feeling bittersweet about it, very, very much so. Um, but the first year is going to be challenging. Um, to me, I found it very, very challenging, um, especially because I'm sure if you talk to any current students or even alumni, people would say that um, there's a lot that is being thrown at you in terms of, you know, just so many choices, opportunities, events, speakers. You just have to, like, you wish you could clone yourself. And so I think um, while business school is definitely, um, you know, an investment I will never regret, at the same time, I also realized that the moment before you join business school, um, take that time to really uh, take a break, because I did not, because <laughs> nobody told me that. I worked all the way until August and then moved from Jakarta to New Haven. Um, and so I was still feeling tired. So if you are going to business school later on, you know, have like those three months of really just two or three months, you know, do volunteering or even, you know, backpacking or vacation. Take some time because it's going to be, a, you know, two years of a lot of, adventure, but also um, you know, time consuming. It's all very, very much so rewarding, but just prepared in advance. The last thing is the advice would be, I think I mentioned this um, a little before, but really when you are talking to um, you know, people who are related to the school, be it alumni, current students, CDO, uh, really pay attention to that kind of like connection that you have with the people you talk to because culture really is, to me, I think if I, I'm super thankful I, I, I got accepted in, in, a, in another school and I pick SOM and I, 
it's just the best decision because I know I belong here. And I kept saying this to some of like my, my mom the other day. I think if I had chosen the other school, I don't think I'd be this kind of happier <laughs> in, in, in this school. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you, Clarine. I really appreciate both of your sharing and your insights. Thank you all for joining us. And if you have any questions, feel free to follow up with our admissions team. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you soon. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>